for me, the relevance of Formula One is actually not that it's motorsport, but it's an environment where people can really challenge each other and challenge themselves. And in doing so, it enables us to innovate, to solve problems, to collaborate in a, in a very creative way. And I think it brings out some very strong things about the way people work together. Jeff, it's great to spend some time with you virtually to talk about Formula One and why the sport matters. Some people might say that in very simplistic terms, it is merely cars going around and around a track as quickly as possible. But how does it filter into our everyday lives? For me, the relevance of Formula One is actually not that it's motorsport, but it's an environment where people can really challenge each other and challenge themselves. And in doing so, it enables us to innovate, to solve problems, to collaborate in a, in a very creative way. And I think it brings out some very strong things about the way people work together. It's this mixture of the technology and the sport and the team and the individual. So in terms of the technology, it's about identifying solutions to a hard problem. In fact, identifying sometimes what the problem is. And Formula One is a bit of a microcosm of the challenges that sometimes we can see in other extreme areas, but it's a, it's a more controlled environment. Now, it's, it's racing cars, and cars look like cars on the road, but as we can talk later, we'll see that there are similarities and differences. But for me, it's all about the collaboration. It's the, it's the challenge, and it's the finding the, the solutions to problems. And I think this is why a lot of companies are interested in Formula One from a partnership point of view, because they can see that we're able to, to do things very quickly and we are really focused on, on solutions and getting those solutions done. And that's what they find interesting. You've worked with a number of Formula One teams over the years. And of course, you've encountered different challenges and seen the way that Formula One has responded and grown. And in particular, that hybrid journey that we're seeing the cars go on, the way that they're powered. Can you describe a little bit that journey for us? So I think in Formula One, you know, the, the days of the pure internal combustion engine are numbered and hybrid technology is the most logical next step. And what we've achieved in Formula One is by showing that you can use hybrid technology in a very, very competitive and demanding environment. We've taken the efficiencies from hybrid technology and you know, imply them in a, in a racing environment. And Formula One has taken on a certain amount of energy management challenge as part of this racing. And in doing so, it's becoming enormously more fuel efficient. So we're using sort of 50% less fuel than we were 10 years ago and going substantially quicker. And we're using technologies which are complex, but uh, we're showing that we can integrate them, we can make them reliable, and we can make them perform at the highest level. And I think this is a you know, a good thing that Formula One's done is embrace this. Now, you have to ask, how do we get here? We first looked in um, 2009, I think it was, at uh, energy recovery, uh, the curve system with a small amount of energy store, a small battery and a, a motor generator that recovered energy under braking and deployed it when the driver went. And this was a sort of foot in the water, really, toe in the water, just to try and understand the technology. And it wasn't quite a big enough change. Now with the change for the full turbo hybrid cars, we got the whole package. We got the efficiency, we got an enormous step of power, huge reduction in fuel consumption. Uh, and we showed that this technology that was sort of laboratory level technology, we could put it into a racing environment. So where do you see it going? Because it already sounds like it's completed most of the journey. Which direction is it going to go in now? The power units at the moment, I think, are showing a very high level of sophistication. And what we really need to do is to change the chassis regulations to, to benefit more from some of that efficiency. So we're in an energy formula now, an efficiency formula. And so we really need to make the chassis more efficient. So we need to generate the the, the downforce which gives the fantastic cornering, braking and accelerating performance of the cars, we need to generate that in a much more efficient way. 
which means changing the bodywork rules, then we can make um, turbo hybrid engines physically smaller, less power, but still achieve the same uh, incredible performance that we got at the moment. So I would say we're, we're on the step. Now, if you ask me the question long term, where are we going with, with Formula One technology? You, you can see in the distance, we probably have to be fully electric but we want to be very, very competitive, fully electric. And I think we've got to be thinking about recovering energy on front wheels and rear wheels, deploying energy on four wheels as well, and really pushing the next level of, of, of energy management, but doing that in a way that we can show that it's still a high performance vehicle. It's still exciting. It's still a challenge for the driver and the engineers to deploy it. And of course, you're talking more specifically there about Formula One and the racing world. But is this something we'll see moving across to the road cars as well? Interesting thing about racing cars and road cars is how the relevance has ebbed and flowed over the years. If you go back sort of 30, 40 years, the high performance sort of GT prototype cars were there was a lot going between high performance road cars and racing cars. But as we went through the 80s and 90s, I think the technologies diverged and Formula One became really very aerospace based technology and less relevant to the road car. What we've seen in the last 10 years, though, is a change where although the technology application is different, both racing and road cars have been pushed into this digital world due to restrictions in testing, cost efficiencies, resource management, we, we've both developed the digital prototypes, the digital twins, we've both become dominated by simulation. So what we're actually finding is we've got different problems to solve, but the realization is that the tool sets that we're using to solve the problems are actually very similar. So when I talk to my co colleagues in uh, Daimler R&D in Stuttgart, there was a sudden sort of realization that Look, we're talking about the same technologies. We're talking about the same applications. Yes, now we understand the relevance. And I think even as we go forwards, we're going to see more and more of this because we're both going to be completely dominated by simulation. And in fact, we're starting to work with Daimler engineers on some of their road car tire modeling because they need to understand some of the subtleties that we've developed in, in understanding racing car tires actually we can apply those models to, to road tyres to improve safety and performance and handling. Wow, so it really is a two-way street. And I can imagine with all of this development, there's a lot of data being transferred, both between yourselves and Daimler, as you mentioned, but then also there's a lot of data transfer already going on at the track between you as engineers and the cars. So this data transfer has just sort of exploded, hasn't it? Um, what? Do, how do you see that changing over the years to come and how has it changed in terms of connectivity and data transfer? Well if I start with your second question first, how has it changed? You're right, it's been an explosion of data. Now I remember 30 years ago we had a few dozen channels. In those days the data on the car was mainly driven by two things about the engine control system, uh, the early digital engine controllers and active ride, the suspension control systems but we had a few dozen channels and now we've got tens of thousands of channels. We've got enormous amounts of data. We know everything that's going on on the car and we know everything that the car's doing and we know almost everything that the driver's doing. And the way we're using that data is really to gain more understanding. It's about validating our, our digital models to, and our digital models are the things that are really driving the development of the vehicles. And understanding how to optimize the vehicle, the race car, when we get to the track. Now, we prepare a lot before we go to a racing circuit. We know what circuit we're going to be at. We've got a good idea which tires, what the challenges of that circuit are. But there are all sorts of small points that are very sensitive, the exact environmental conditions, the interaction between the tarmac and the tires on that day. And measuring all that data is critical for us to try and understand how to change our models and how to put that information back in to get our car into its optimum position. So data is really, really critical to us. The way I see the future developing is understanding that data better, pulling more of that data in, learning more from that data. And I think learning is the key point because the learning, the understanding is what enables us to make the developments to, to improve the technology. 
So the data, acquiring it in an accurate and, and um, structured way, and then using other tools to start exploring that data is really critical. And of course, you say learning. Is that then machine learning that you're really referring to as well? Certainly, one of the tools that we're starting to learn and experiment with is in the area of artificial intelligence is machine learning. You know, how do we take these enormous quantities of data and how do we pick the patterns out of it? How do we pick the, the key bits? And we're starting to look at the, this machine learning technology. We've been working with our some number of our partners for several years now. Um, it's certainly very much the flavor of the time, machine learning. And I think we've learned which areas of our business are working with the technology at the moment, which don't. And some applications we found very, very effective. We found ways of shortcutting a lot of human time in recognizing shapes and patterns and um, analyzing images. Uh, we've been applying it to understanding when we get faulty signals, what the, what's causing those problems. Is it, is it a sensor problem or is it real data issues? We're trying to use them to predict things. We're finding that's more difficult. And we're also trying to use them in assisting us with race strategy, which is becoming very, very challenging because this has been moving you into the area of, of gaming and game theory. Um, so we've, we've got a good idea about which things are working at the moment. But I'd say this, we just opened the door into a completely new, new area of, uh, of experimentation for us. Of course, it's not completely automatic. You can't just let the machine do everything. There's a lot of human uh, interaction still required, but what we're trying to do is augment the human uh, capacity, and particularly with these enormous amounts of data, find some way of really extracting the deep knowledge and the deep understanding from it. And I think that's the key for us to make quick developments. Wow, so many things to have to be focusing on and in your role leading parts of the team. Um, how do you project manage as it were? Of course you all set out with the same objective, it seems from the outside a fairly simple task, go out and win a championship, um, but how do you manage that on a day-to-day -day level, making sure that you are all focusing with the same intent on this, this huge scale project? The key to keep the team really focused is to understand that we're all trying to solve the same problem. The overall goal is very clear, you know, we want to win championships and we win championships through winning lots of races. We can define the things that we need to have in order to be able to win races, but we then need to break them down into what are the key points. And I think a lot of organizations struggle to really tackle what are the real problems. As humans, we're all very good, we love problems and we jump on problems and we try and find solutions. But one of our common uh, tendencies is to reach for the first problem that we identify. And one of the key things we've been working on within, within the team is to really try and structure that approach to say, let's define these problems carefully, make sure we've, we, we've challenged each other on defining the problems, and then once we've defined the problems, and we do this with a small group, then of course we can extend that, we can hand those problems out to the much bigger organization, and then we can use the full power of the organization to find the solutions. So the, I think the real key is one of alignment. So you've got the alignment of intent, but then you've got the alignment of what the objectives are. What, you know, what are your half dozen things that you must achieve? And once we've all agreed those and and properly you know peer reviewed them and challenge each other that we are actually that is the real problem then it actually becomes much more straightforward of course the problems themselves are hard and you've still got a big challenge to solve them of course and and you mentioned working with a small group to start with but of course that intent that that culture has got to seep out through the company to ensure that from monday through to sunday every week week in week out everyone is following what's been set out primarily in that first smaller group. And that's, that's a difficult task as well, isn't it? It is. I think what happens is, as you say, you know, the intent, the problem definition gets defined from the top, but the solutions, the innovation, the challenge, this constant new ideas and, uh, and drive, that very much drives up from the bottom of the organisation, from, uh, from usually the younger members of the organisation. Um, and certainly we can't direct the whole organisation 
can't direct the solution. What we have to do is to enable the organization to understand how each individual can contribute, how each individual is aligned with part of the problem, and then build all that problem up together. So it's very much a collaborative effort, and, and you, you sometimes don't see where the solutions are going to come from because they're coming from such a broad base. And you mentioned peer review. How do you keep assessing what you're setting out to achieve and if you are achieving it when Formula One is by nature such a fast paced industry added to the fact that it's all over the world and you're constantly traveling and it's difficult to sort of get everyone back together and assess the situation? We've got quite a good process of reviewing each race and test performance. So within probably 48 hours of the end of the race weekend, we're having a meeting which has already had analysis work done on the data where we've already had a first cut if you like of the of, of, of the assessment of the weekend we've identified areas that were good areas that were poor um, and we've defined areas for, uh, for others to do more will work on but as you said in your point it's, it is a very quick fast paced process and sometimes we've only got one or well, less than one week between the end of the race and the beginning of the of the following race weekend so we have to have a very procedural approach, um, but we also have to be mindful that um, we need to learn from both the good and the bad. And sometimes you're very much focused on what did you do wrong, but other times you've got to look at, well, what did we do right? And sometimes you, you are stronger than you expected, and, and that gives you a clue. So it's having the structured approach, making sure you look at the data, uh, making sure that you, you, if you don't know, you don't jump to conclusions, but you, go away and say right we don't know let's look at more data let's do another experiment let's tie it in with simulation let's end up with a good objective rational understanding of our performance but i go back to the original question of why does f1 matter i think we've covered so many different areas that f1 touches upon that it's it almost answers itself doesn't it really that question now well i think it's a fantastic business to be in because you've got all this challenge all the time you know, it, 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 there isn't an easy answer. Sometimes you don't even know if there's an answer, but it's that always that challenge, the, the looking over your shoulder, thinking, well, maybe the competition's going to find out before us. And I think that that hunger, that sort of um, sense of unease, it's not for everybody, but it's uh, it's certainly what drives us in in the team, and that's what drives us to succeed. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for talking us through that that big, big question: Why does F1 matter? And hopefully, we'll be racing again soon. I do hope so. <laughs>